Hey, everybody. This week's episode of the r r Show is brought to you by you fine folks. Thank you so much for supporting the show. And also, thank you so much for Chris George for showing up this week. Ruel could not make it for, what are we at? Episode 56 of the r r Show. So instead of this week being um, Rado and Ruel, it's Rado and Room and Board. Chris George, uh, say hi to the nice people. Tell us about yourself. Hey everybody, uh, thanks so much for having me on. I am really excited to do this top 10 because every Monday on my channel, Room and Board, which is at Room and Board Reviews, I look at everything leaving Kickstarter that week. Yes. And Kickstarter, GameFound, BackerKit, uh, Mom and Dad Give Me Money for My Startup.com, any of those lucrative sites. I take a look at, and uh, and it was fun to look through the entire year and see which ones jumped out at me and then try to rank them. Uh, so I, I'm really excited to be on this stream in particular. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can't wait to see what you have as your picks. As oh, well. yeah. And and me, you. I mean, because I am a huge fan. Folks, there's a link for Chris's uh, channel down in the show notes. I highly recommend subscribing if you're at all interested in crowdfunding games. Because like week in, week out, you are there doing deep dives deeper than anybody except for maybe me i like to think i also spend a lot of time reading rule books and learning how the game actually plays rather than just commenting on the box art or um you know how many miniatures i mean so you really dig die and uh, really give a lot of detail about the gameplay and why it stands out but then also you focus a lot on the value too um are people getting their money's worth is shipping too much and so i think you between your humor and your breadth of knowledge and your willingness to really um, look uh, you know, below the surface, I, I think it's a fantastic show. Plus, if that's not enough, folks, you also want to subscribe because you occasionally do top five reasons not to back, which I know is by far your biggest series, I think, right? Yeah, it's it's absolutely my biggest series. Uh, uh, if there any time a game raises over $1 million on Kickstarter, I feel the pull as Chris saying, Mo, you need this game. You desperately need this game. It's the best game in the world. Yes. If you don't have this game on your shelf, you're not even... You don't even deserve to be called a board gamer. Uh, and so these videos are a way for me to help talk myself down and do kind of a deep dive into into the rules, as long as they have them there, do a deep dive into the mechanics and, and think about the logistics of how many times will that game get played? Will it replace existing games? Those sorts of questions. Uh, I always like to start it off with what I am excited about before I tear that excitement away from people. Uh, and uh, it, they're, they're by far the biggest, um, the biggest hit. And it's surprising to me uh, that people keep on asking for them. Anytime something crosses, I'll get a message and say, hey, are, are, I'm excited to see the five reasons why I shouldn't back this thing. Uh, because I think in in the YouTube space, it's easy to get excited. We're, we're all oh, excited yeah. about games, right? Oh, yeah. We yeah. love talking about games. We, we love this hobby. That's why we do this thing. Uh, so I tried to do my best to be the devil's advocate and, uh, and, and pump the brakes a little bit on that excitement so we can make sure that it's not the marketing getting us to back it, but it is actually our excitement. Itself game yeah. that gets us to back because yeah, yeah. yeah we want to have cool stuff but we want to have stuff that you're equally excited when it arrives at your door and you don't go oh shoot why did i back this again <laughs> right then that to me is it means and i've had both of those things happen uh and and i know i've i've fallen for the trap numerous times of of backing things and then getting it and going oh yeah Maybe I didn't look into this enough, or maybe I wasn't excited enough to, to purchase it, because it doesn't end up getting yeah. to the table. Folks, I am an excitable guy. I get really excited about a lot of stuff. Chris is the antidote to that. Um, <laughs> he is the anti-FOMO. There's his uh, channel right down there, and you're going to get a little taste of it, because, folks, we are about to talk about our... Uh, combined top 10 crowdfunded games of 2022. Games that were seeking funding on Kickstarter, on GameFound, and maybe on BackerKit? Uh, they're a little late to the party, but we'll see what you've got in mind. And I can't wait to see what Chris is going to do because of his very specific focus. I know what mine are. Uh, Chris, are you ready to go? Do you have ready. your number 10, or I should say our number 10, in the queue? Our number 10. I do have it ready. Uh, I think you have a link there and can bring it up. But uh, I am prepared. But, uh, uh, so my number 10 should be, uh, I'm scared to say it in case the links are out of order, but I don't think they are. My, my number we'll 10 is, is Raw. The oh, the, the anniversary edition, right? The anniversary edition of Raw, reprinted by 25th Century Games. Okay. Uh, let's bring Raw, that up. Let's bring it up. That let's is a good starting choice. I like Raw, it a lot. Yeah. Raw is a pure, there it is. Raw is a pure auction game. That's it, 
right? You're gonna, on your turn, you're gonna either draw a tile from the bag and add it to the row of things that people can bid on, or you're going to say, rah, and chant, rah, 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 grab that big old statue right there, put it in front of yourself, and then everyone gets to make one bid with those little sun discs, sundials that you see on the table. Yep. And, uh, it, and if you invoke raw, the key is you get to go last in the bidding, which is huge when everybody's only making one bid. In addition to that, you're also bidding on that number in the center. Oh, it's like it's like I planned this with this slideshow. <laughs> uh, you're a professional, <laughs> sir. Well done. Smooth as silk until you brought it all crashing to all to explain it how all good you are. Down. Well, I, you know, I like to pat myself on the back uh, pretty much consistently. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, you're also you're bidding on that tile in the center, which you will get to use for subsequent round there's there's three epochs and uh, you're gonna go through all three and and i love that this came back yeah. i know this was out of print for a long time this is this is it, it's not necessarily that uh i was really excited about the deluxe edition because they had a retail edition for i think 40 bucks and a deluxe for 80 bucks um it's not that i was like clamoring to get this deluxe edition where all the tiles were wood instead of cardboard but I'm just so thrilled because I've seen it. I, I, I get a lot of my games on the secondary market and I've seen it hit that out of print status and you have an out of print Reiner Knizia, who's a well-known designer. Uh, it, it makes people feel like they need to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars to acquire this jewel that's not sure. in their collection. Yep. And so by this coming back at what I think is a really affordable price, uh, was was very exciting to me. I I didn't end up pulling the trigger on this because I know it's going to go to retail, right? If right. you're if you're backing at this level, it was more to get that deluxe edition with the wood and the the extra metal metal victory point tokens and really just deluxifying your experience. And I'm thrilled that that exists for for people who want that. For me, the retail edition would be completely fine. Uh, and, and I'm excited to add this to my collection. I almost brought a copy of this home with me from the World Series of Board Gaming because we had some extra copies there. Uh, for, for those who don't know, I've done some work for the World Series of Board Gaming as well, and it's one of the games, and, but I couldn't fit into my suitcase, oh. and I couldn't justify bringing it home because I had to bring home other games that I didn't have that had cards. So if I was doing post-production work on them and taking shots of the cards, I, I needed the actual cards that I could then oh, put I on see. the screen. Yeah. And there, there weren't any elements that I could really justify to myself other than I want it uh, <laughs> in my collection. But uh, yeah, I just, I, I'm thrilled that this is back. I'm thrilled that this is back at a great price point. And this edition looks really gorgeous. It's never so looked it, better. I mean, it now yeah. looks as good as it has always played going all yeah. the way back. It's an excellent choice. I agree. And uh, so far, so good. You, you are definitely having an excellent showing. The only reason this one have made my personal list is because yeah. one of the things, which we didn't talk about uh, much about our restrictions, yeah. but I restricted myself to only talking about completely new games. I mean, there yeah. were actually quite a few um, really uh, beautiful recreations, reproductions of some older games. I mean, heck, this wasn't even the only Reiner Knizia that came out this year. Amon, Amon Ray, Ray also got yeah. a beautiful deluxe uh, treatment also. But I was just trying to focus on completely new stuff. But yeah, this would totally make my list. One of the greatest auction games of all time. Even works well with two, even if originally it wasn't supposed to. And I, I don't think you mentioned this. For me, the thing that really makes it stand out is, hey, when I'm making my bid, I can see everybody else's chips. I know exactly yeah. what everybody else can do. Oh, the best you've got is a three. So if, if I bid with this four, but oh, you can still do it. But you don't want this. I can see what you're going for. So deep, so meaty. It's a brilliant game and uh, wonderful. And, it's, and you're right. It's so good that people... Have, I mean, you know, yeah. it, it, it looks nice and modern. It doesn't look old and dusty, you know, because it's a 20 year old game. Um, but it plays yeah, as good as yeah. anything that just came out. Good call, sir. All right. Well, let's move on to uh, number nine, which actually, I'm just now saying that out loud. I'm realizing I am breaking my own rule that I just set down for myself because <laughs> number nine on the list is the Paradox Initiative, which is. A reprint of an earlier game called Paradox. And, oh my gosh, it didn't even occur to me until just now. But I loved it so much. Actually, I should say, um, when I was making uh, my list of my fives, numbers uh, 9, 7, 5, 3, and 1, I was thinking about, um, you know, which ones did Jen and I play, because when we covered them for the channel, uh, and which ones did really stood out for my wife as much as me. And, geez louise, she loved this game so much. She almost gave this a 5 out of 5, which is very rare for her. And for folks who don't know anything about it, hey, you can, late pledge now... Uh, uh, this is basically a board game equivalent of 
I don't know, Gem Blow, or, you know, pick your matching gems video game, I mean, or go back to classic stuff like Dr. Mario and whatnot. It turns that into board game form, but adds this really cool sci-fi epic uh, resource management game because you're trying to collect all the stuff so that you can draft gorgeous cards. Um, this game, one of the big things about it was is they had a murderer's row of artists, some of the best, hottest, most well-loved artists in the industry, all of them producing new original art to represent all the different planets that we as scientists are studying all around the galaxy, trying to do card set collection, but driven by a very sharp and fun little puzzly game as you're just trying to move your little uh, colorful gems around to get rows, you know, three or four or five of a kind in a row so they'll explode, yay, and create the cascade stuff and let you pick up things. Um, the, you know, it's, it's a really simple, straightforward game. It's got a really gorgeous production. And again, I mean, some of my favorite artists of all time worked on this. Although, even if you didn't get the deluxe edition, you're still going to get a really sharp game. We covered this a million years ago when it was just called uh, Paradox, and it looked okay. But much like uh, the one you just mentioned, Raw, it really stands out now. And I'm looking for a video of it, but there's no video because I generally don't go back and look at uh, pages after they're done. But just look at this art. The art is great, but the gameplay is what really sold it to me all those years ago. And I'm really embarrassed that I completely broke my own rule with the very first entry, number nine, <laughs> Paradox Initiative. That's funny. Yeah, I, I remember the Paradox I Initiative uh, when it came out. I, I think... I was, I was, I hadn't, I didn't play it, but I, okay. I felt a little bit underwhelmed by the, the sort of Candy Crush nature of the choice. Candy Crush, that's a good reference. That's, yeah. finger on the pulse, topical, <laughs> uh, Dr. Mario, kids haven't heard of that. Candy Crush, yes. Oh, Dr. Mario, yeah, well, Dr. Mario should be the reference. Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I, I remember really enjoying the art. I like how the, the, the worlds flip too, when yes. there's, when there are those I mean, sort when of, when they've been hit by the roving black hole yeah. thing. Yeah. I liked I liked having to manage that. I, I remember that standing out to me too. Yeah. But I I think yeah for my like for my person I'm I'm glad that it was it was such a hit though. Yeah. Uh, I tend to lean towards um again like we were we were talking about in the, in the pre show a, a little bit of the longer the longer games. Yeah. So I, I I this one didn't pull me in because I was like oh, okay I see the gimmick and I don't know how how uh, long that would that would last for me personally. Right. Okay, cool. Well, then nice, tell yeah, us about number eight then and why that's even better. Well, number eight is a campaign that I am really, really thrilled to talk about. Okay. Uh, I had to include it in the top half so that I could talk about. It is this probably one of the more obscure games out there. All right. Uh, I, I like these obscure games. I, I'm pulling up my Word document to make sure I get the exact name of it right because the names are always weird. It's by this, this designer, Bez, and the, they actually put out a four-pack of games. It was this Kickstarter. But uh, the game that I am most excited about is called A Game About Cute Comical Creatures and Trying to Identify Them After Someone Makes Noises. <laughs> creatures and someone trying to identify them what after someone makes noises <laughs> the title of the game after someone makes noises <laughs> that does not fit at the bottom of the screen that that will have to do folks that will uh, have to do and pull the, up this page wow it i completely missed this to one a game okay. it's a sequel to a game um called We Whimsical Creatures and Trying to Identify Them After Someone Makes a Noise. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's like the third one scrolling down. So there's there's four games in okay. this package. Um, Bez puts out these small card games, and they've only been print and plays, generally, unless you live in the UK, uh, because right. it's it's a small operation. Yes. They're, just, they're just doing it uh, on their own and, and mailing it out. And so I got the print and play of We Whimsical Creatures, and it's just, uh, yeah, going just down... No, no, go go down further. Keep going. Start, okay. keep going, keep going, keep going. That's the one right there. That that's the that's the picture I want to see. All right. The whole premise of this game is that uh, it's kind of like Dixit with uh, screaming, <laughs> <laughs> where where you have these creatures that are out on a board, and someone is going to be sort of the clue giver, and they're going to make a sound of what they think this creature oh, will sound okay. like. Oh, okay. And then everybody is going to vote on what creature they think they were trying to make the sound for. That's that's it for the game. You get points, whatever. The, the scoring doesn't matter to me whatsoever. Right. It's much the, like it's Dixit. The, much like Dixit, exactly. It's the absolute silliness 
that this game can provide. And so in this campaign, uh, there was finally, they, they finally opened up shipping to, to everyone. So oh, okay. I was like, yes, I want to get a printed, uh, printed copy sent to me versus my print and play one that I, uh, that is, is not in good card quality. I want a nice <laughs> card quality that I can pull out uh, because I think this is just so funny. It's my favorite type of dumb humor in which you're just sitting around a table, a table just being silly. Uh, for It's w what I think would be an incredible icebreaker of getting people out of their shells. I, I don't think it would be for everybody, right? Yeah. Because if you don't have people who are willing to go to that level, but I think it just takes one person around the table to, to really break the level of what it can be and give permission for the group to, to be silly and to laugh and just to, to make funny voices with each other. Uh, I, I just think it's, it's such a fun little game. And when I did, I did my top five Kickstarters of 2021. Yeah. We Wims of the Creatures, I think was, it, it might've been number one. I, I forget what it was. I just, I just love the concept so much. And I, and I love that I was able to actually get a printed copy for myself. And, and that will enable me to really bring it to more places yeah, yeah, rather yeah, than, yeah. than pulling up my own print and play and saying, no, no, trust me, this is really fun. It's better to have like a deck of cards and be like, trust me, here we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just think it's it's such a funny concept, and I like all the other games that that they. I was going to say the other three games would were, were also standouts. Yeah, they they're, they they didn't stand out as much for me. There was another game that I backed last year that was a game about frantically grabbing beet roots that gets harder and harder. I think was the title, something along those lines, <laughs> uh, which was like a speed matching game, which kind of reminded me uh, a bit of a fa of a favorite of mine, Dutch Blitz, and, uh, and and so that that was a really fun one, and I didn't look too much into the other three because honestly i wanted to spend all my time talking about a game about cute comical creatures and trying to invest in <laughs> identify them after someone makes noises <laughs> yep well, well folks if you want to find out more about that uh, apparently this whole thing was called games about stuff we could have just called it that our number eight <laughs> entry games about stuff from bez links for this and everything are going to be down in the show notes um i i have to admit i mean uh as somebody who's played a lot of dixit um, at parties and with social gathering. That's just such a cute, simple, perfect idea. I can imagine, oh, here's the four, and I make that sound. That's, uh, yeah. and, and I've, I've played uh, some of Bez's other games, and yeah, very, very oh, sharp. Nice. You know, really yeah. flying under the radar. A, a wonderful entry. I love it a lot. Wow, that is cool. See, folks, this is why you want to go subscribe to this man's channel, because you would have heard about this months ago, um, and you wouldn't have missed it. But maybe there's still a chance. Uh, follow the link down in the show notes for number eight, a game about cute, comical creatures and someone trying to identify after someone makes noises. <laughs> okay. Cool. A great, a great title. Well typed in yes. a very short amount of time. <laughs> yep. You'll, you won't bring it out of your pocket unless somebody can actually name it correctly at the party. What is it? True. I mean, yeah. You say it, you know what it is. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, let's move on then to number seven on the list. A much shorter title, Delta. Delta. Nice and easy for me to type in. Much less likely to make typos. Thank you so very much for that. Um, you know, and this is another one that just ranks so high uh, for my wife, especially, and for me as well. This is a fairly crunchy deck builder where we are in a steampunk universe trying to explore... Oh, there's a play on this one. Good. Okay. I will put that on screen, and I will make it bigger, and I will make it bigger, bigger, bigger. There we go. Okay. Are you playing? There you go. There you're playing. Okay. Uh, a, a game um, where we are deck building, and the thing is, all the cards we're getting into our deck are multi-use. Uh, they represent different members of our expedition party who are either hanging out in the workshop trying to make inventions, uh, going to the university to gather knowledge, or actually going out in the field, um, either on foot or in hot air balloons. And depending on what card you play at a given round and um, where you send it means the cards will do different things because uh, different characters have different specialties, but they also have different initiatives, which has to do with speed. This is a game all about kind of like almost a Gloomhaven vibe. Who is going to go first? Because when I play a card to the university, because I want to, you know, study the mating practices of the robo rhino or rhinoceros or whatever it would be, I'm also trying to figure out, am I going to try and go fast or slow? Because whoever has the best initiative gets first dibs on the cards at the top of the area that will go into our deck and determines what we get to do next turn. So, 
you already have multi-use with these cards, trying to figure out where is best to play them to get the most effect. But also, when you get that initiative, because there will always be cards, okay, I don't care about those ones, I desperately have to have that one. But my fastest card that can ensure I get that one into my deck uh, does nothing in that region. It's a total waste. So what am I actually going to focus on? What is going to be my priority? This game really makes you think long and hard. And plus, I also love, uh, they don't really talk it up very much, but I, I show it in the run-through we did. Let's see. I don't know if there'd be a way to show it. There's just the game in all its glory. You don't. After you've played your cards, they don't come right into your discard pile like a normal deck builder. They instead go into a queue, very much like Alexander Pfister's um, Mombasa or uh, Blackout Hong Kong or Sky Mines, his new reprint. And so that means wh where you're placing your cards determines what are you going to do, how good is your character going to be at it? What is going to be your speed with which you can build to get cards you want in the future? And also, what silo is your card going to come in? Because you only get to co collect cards from one silo every round. So if you play a card, you might not see it for quite a while. And all of those things, with every single card play, adds so much to the proceedings that both Jen and I were really blown away by it. Number eight on the list, Delta. Okay. And uh, I don't know, seven. I'm sure this is, I don't know, this is probably not one you played, but you probably looked at it. What was yeah. your, what was your prognosis? I, I, I like this as a pick. I, I'm thrilled that you had such a good time with it. I, I really like the multi-use cards and I really like the, uh, the, the three different areas, the, th the fact that there are sort of three decisions, yeah. three spots that you can choose where to, where to apply your people. Uh, I, I think that makes for, uh, not too overwhelming a decision space, right? Right. Uh, I think you don't want that overwhelming of, of all these different locations. I feel with a lot of like Euro games, people add more and more and more and more and more spots because they're like, oh, there's a rondelle over here and a thing to do over here. But this one to me felt really stream streamlined. And I really like the manner of the of the cards as well. Yeah, you, you really do get a sense of purpose and direction. But then the hard thing is, oh, well, clearly the best use for this card, what is best for this card is not best for me right now. And yeah, when I play yeah. it, am I going to make the card happy or am I going to make me happy? Which is not a consideration I normally have. Um, I don't tend to anthropomorphize my cards as much as I did in this game. And uh, yeah, are really, really sharp. But what would be our number six on the list, sir? Number six. Hopefully a shorter title. Because I'm having to type a them shorter all. title, a shorter title. It's only seven. It's only seven letters. Okay. Um, it's only seven letters. Um, yeah. My my number six is a game that was on Game Found. Okay. Uh, plays one to two players, and that's Robomon. <gasps> all right. Yes. Um, Robomon. Wow. It's like Ruel is here in person because <laughs> Ruel covered this one for the oh, channel. Did he? Yes, he did. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I. I, it's my shout out to Ruel. I knew it. Shout out to the R and R. It's now the R and R and R. There you go. Right here. Um, I was so so charmed by this campaign. Uh, that's that's the creator right there, and and, and that video is just a big unboxing. Yeah. Of of going through the the prototype and all the different things that you have. It it is Pokemon, but with robots. And, yes. And it says it's a one to two player game. I think it's probably more just a one player game yeah. uh, where you're going to go on your own journey. And I'm not really a solo player. I, I, I like games specifically to, to play with other people. Uh, and if I'm by myself, I might veer more towards like uh, digital implementations mm -hmm. of stuff. But this one just was so, so charming to me. It uh, it, it really captured me. I, I love that... Uh, I, I love that there's a bunch of puzzles throughout the game. Uh, you, you get a four-digit code that you can then look up in a book, and you can see, oh, that's that's the, I've solved the clue. Or if you don't solve the clue, then you don't. Uh, I, I love that in each different map, there's a little QR code on the side that you can scan, and you can get music that suits the location that you're in. Uh, yes. There's a bunch of different mm -hmm. areas that you can visit. and, and Perfectly and realized them. video game music that sounds right yeah. out of Pokemon on a Game Boy Advance. Yeah, it's just so good. Yeah, because they gave they gave um, examples of it obviously in the campaign page because yeah. you have to lead with that because it, it it's great. It, it builds to this world. Uh, I love their storage system is thought out too. They have all of the Robomon chips face down in like a dual layer storage system that you can you can lift out and uh, and access pretty easily based around their number. Uh, and if you have any nostalgia towards Pokemon, which I absolutely do, I have mm -hmm. the poster of the 150 Pokemon it from my childhood in my bathroom right now. Um, 
Because of course, that's where you put it, obviously. Because of course. So everybody can pick their favorites when they're doing their business, you know? (laughs) They got a, they got 150 friends that can cheer them on, no matter the situation. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it it really it really tugged at my nostalgia, and I think what really made this one stand out amongst the the slew of narrative campaign games that exist out there uh, was that it is such a unique theme, unique art style, and the clear passion behind. Yeah the this project you can see it in the videos you can see the enthusiasm you can you can read it in the script uh it it, there's a comic book that you get to go on that that that's what teaches you the game they're like the the game will teach it to you as you go along there's no need to read even read a rule book to start um so i read the rules reference to see the different little little mechanics right but it just it just feels so realized and so thoughtful it feels like a really thoughtful game and even though i'm not a solo player this makes me want to become one because uh Mm. it it is so nice yep so yeah yeah that's why uh, that's why it's my number six i wanted to give it a shout out because uh it's just such a fun world and just such a fun sandbox Yep, yeah, you you done right by Ruel. I mean, there's his quote for it. I, he absolutely adored it, and I think you're right. I mean, the number one, uh, two, the two active words, charm and nostalgia, yeah. and this delivers yeah. on both of those in spades. It seems so absolutely lovely. Um, good call, good call. Uh, alrighty, well, let's move on then to number five, uh, another smaller game. I think actually this is. Physically, maybe the smallest game um, that I identified. I've got some big heavy ones coming too. But uh, also, this is the uh, newest one. This one, I think, only just ended its run maybe last week or the week before. But I fell in love with it, as did, it seems, almost the entirety of the board game media space. Uh, Except for maybe you, Chris. Uh, Have you played Shake That City? I haven't played Shake That City, but I've looked at it uh, intensely. Uh, I'm excited that you that you loved it so much that it it's it forced its way on the list. Oh, I, think it's I a good loved it, as did my wife. Um, and you'll know, really at the heart of it, this is a pretty straightforward, um, you know, uh, you know, pretty simple to play. Are you gonna play there, buddy? There you go. Uh, Sim City style board game. We've had a lot of these over the years, and I, it's actually uh, something I tend to really enjoy. Um, and the Sim City part is really simple. A lot of times these have the suburbia vibe of, oh, if I put this next to this, I've got to put these other two things over here. This is a much more straightforward gateway friendly game because all you're trying to do is make sure you get big groups of the same types of things with some simple rules. Like, homes want to be on the beach. Um, you know, businesses want to be on the road. Stuff like that. Really simple rules. But what makes this game so special is the selection mechanism. You have this really cool shaker, which is just a brilliant piece of like cardboard engineering, where you, every turn you shake it up, push a little plunger, and a randomly created grid of three by three cubes comes out. And it's a bingo style game in that everybody gets to pick. Well, the lead player gets to first pick, chooses one color, and then everybody else picks from the remaining colors that are there, trying to um, fill up their space as best they can. This is from AEG, who were incredibly successful with Tiny Towns, and a lot of people draw yeah. parallels between this and Tiny Towns. Um, but this one is much, much lighter. It's a simple, streamlined, straightforward game. It's literally a filler. Jen and I could play this game in 15 or 20 minutes from start to finish and would just play it again and again and again. Uh, there's a, a little bit of variability because you can um, set up different... Uh, there's like little mini modules. I believe there was actually another mini module that was available if you backed it. But every time you play, just the randomization of the cards. Am I going to build this particular shape of red or this particular shape of blue? Or, oh my God, more often not, I don't want to build any of these things. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Because, like Tiny Towns, you have a very, very tiny space to build in and a really interesting restricted puzzle. Every round is an interesting puzzle. Do I take the nice, simple, safe thing, or do I risk big, hoping I'll get what I need later when it's my turn to be first and I get first dibs? Everything about this game is great, but really, the um, the core central conceit, the gimmick of the shaker, just never gets old. To me, this is the best physical board game gig- the gimmick the industry has seen since the gears in Zulk and the Mayan calendar. And while that was a big, heavy, crunchy Omega game, this is a fun, simple little game you can teach anybody to play. Play in 20 minutes, and I guarantee they'll want to play again. And everybody will fight to be who gets the one to actually shake the city, uh, which is why it comes in at number five. Yeah, uh, well, I obviously made the comparison between it and Tiny Towns, but I think what you said is right on the money, that Tiny Towns is definitely meaner. You know, <laughs> uh, Tiny Towns is definitely 
depending on how you play. There's different modes. But yeah, yeah Tiny Towns true. can be played at uh, expert level, which is how Jen and I play, where we where it's not a random choice, but we choose what yeah. town's going to be. Oh, it'd be a yeah. really bad time for you to get some glass, wouldn't it? And it doesn't hurt me. Yep, hey, what do you know? It's glass this turn. Here, yeah. the game is mean to you, and it, it's a pretty much an equal opportunity, mean to everybody kind of situation. But yeah, the big thing yeah, is, I, Tiny Towns is more complex because all the different buildings you can have have a lot of actually, um, you know, it's a more gamery type game, whereas this is simple, easy to teach. I could certainly teach this to my in-laws and they would not have a hard time and everybody would just be so entranced and enchanted by that shaker. But, you know, they cut, they come for the shaker, but you stay for the fun, puzzly gameplay that you just get in and out in 15, 20 minutes and you just have a fantastic time. Yeah, I really like AEG. I, I, I remember looking at this campaign. I also think the price on this campaign is pretty decent, too. Yeah. You get you get that little Wild Knights expansion. Yes, that's what it was, yeah. Cubes. Which are an extra type of uh, a wild uh, cube that you can throw into the mix, yeah. Yeah, and so having that, which is going to be sold, it kind of offsets the shipping. That's what I always look for in Kickstarters, like if the stretch goals will offset the shipping. I, I think this one looks fun. Uh, for me, this one, I was would contemplate picking up at retail because I know AEG also has You know it'll be there, yeah. You know it's going to be there. It's not. It's not a worry that it's not going to get that sort of wider distribution as some of the other Kickstarters might be. Yep. Uh, and so, so whenever I see that, it's like, okay, well, do I want to pay for the shipping now and get those extra things, or would I be fine without it? And uh, and I was like, I'd probably be fine without it, but it's definitely something that that Folks. I think. This is the kind of analysis you get on Room and Board. Again, links for it down in the show notes. If you pay attention, if you came to this video, obviously you care about crowdfunding games. And if you pay attention to that world at all, you have to see his weekly analysis going deep, deeper than anybody else I've seen, myself included, with my own uh, crowdfunding show. Uh, yeah, good observations all. What's number four? Number four. Ooh. Oh, Ooh. I'm so excited. Ah. I'm getting I'm getting excited. I, I, every time we 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 climb to it feels even more monumental. Um, my number four is a game that I actually did get to try when I was at Origins. Yes. Uh, that's probably why it moved up so so far. Oh, so you have uh, played it? Okay, yeah, yeah. I have played it. Uh, it's uh, it's by Mind Clash Games. Oh, oh, and that is the Witch Sept one, right? That's exactly it. The Witch one, Septima. Uh, gotcha. Okay. A blast. I mean, I. I'm really becoming a fan of Mind Clash, and I was expecting this to be overly complicated like I find a lot of their titles are. Uh, yes. they, they really go for that crunch, right? Um, with Septima, it's not overly complicated. I think it, it's gonna be really easy for people to pick up, and it's in a it's in a theme that I don't I don't want to say isn't done because there's a lot of witchy themes, right? There's a lot of like spooky, scary yeah. themes. But this one, again, is is really charming. You have simultaneous action selection, and you all pick a card. But if you pick the same card as somebody else, you all get to do a bonus move. But the town takes notice because you're being overtly witchy, and they get a little bit spooked about it. <laughs> uh, and so you go through, and you're going to be adding to your own little coven as you play the game. There's going to be a witch trial every round, and you're going to try to put your own supporters into that trial area and right. and uh you know stamp out the bigotry because the people who don't like magic your your witches your whole your sole purpose is to cure the town and yet the town is fighting back against you you're still as altruistic as possible as so you're going to move around this board and get different resources and the different resources that you can get uh depend upon the cycle of the moon as well so there's a lot of like little nice tweaks all that kind of build up to be something really satisfying it was it was a lot of fun to to test out at origins um this is one again for me that i think those who back the deluxe edition which is the only edition that they're offering on kickstarter uh will be happy that they mm. did because they've got they've got game trays they've got uh silk screen meeples they've got a bunch of nice deluxifications and they've got a lot uh they've got a small um little expansion for me I think, again, the retail would be fine for my purposes, so I right. didn't end up pulling the trigger here, but I intend to get it at retail because I don't need those uh, those extra stuff. And in fact, I I wasn't that interested in the little expansion where you do get to turn into uh, an animal. You can shapeshift into an animal figure. And now that I'm saying it out loud, obviously <laughs> I'm a fool. And You're full of regret. That. But uh, this is one where, for the Deluxe Edition, I, I think... You get a lot of great stuff, but for me, I don't think I'm going to need that stuff for this game to be fun. And so I'm happy getting it at retail, 
for not paying the shipping and not paying those ex- for those extra components. Uh, I think this is going to be a great game, though, and yeah. one that I know uh, my girlfriend Renee will enjoy playing. And and so it's it's almost an auto buy for me when it does hit retail yeah. because I did enjoy my my play of it uh, so much. Yeah, um, actually, Kimberly covered uh, the game for our us on the channel when it came out and she was a big fan too and, and you mentioned it right up front i think it is important to reiterate uh the big thing about this game and oh you're back again your internet is starting to fail folks he literally had people out to ensure his internet was rock solid yesterday they all lied to him would you like to give a shout out to your isp in canada yeah shout out to uh not rogers <laughs> there you go awful. No, no. Um, but uh, this, people tend to think of Mind Clash games as super crunchy, super heavy. Your Anachronies, your Trickerians, your Perseverance. This game is definitely, I mean, it's, 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 it's not a party game by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not a gateway, but it is a little bit lighter. There's not quite so much heavy lifting on this game, too, in case you might be somebody who would have been scared. Of, oh, I like the subject matter, but oh, they're games, they're too big and long. This is not like that. Yeah, I th- it feels very accessible to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Point. Well, let's move on to number three on the list. Uh, and now this is the uh, biggest game on uh, my list, and I'm absolutely in love with it. Uh, it is Unconscious Mind, which, geez louise, Fantasia, the publisher uh, who's behind this and also behind this year's big, big hit, Endless Winter, they are definitely a force to be reckoned with. What they are producing are... Uh, w- so, gobsmackingly and beautiful. I mean, this game... Uh, you know, their last game, Endless Winter, took my favorite artist of all time, Demiko, and made this wonderful Paleo-American thing. This one combines two, my second favorite, and I think my fifth favorite artist of all time, Vincent Dutre and Andrew Bosley, making an absolutely stunning-looking game all about, um, you know, beginning of the 19th century psychoanalyst uh, in Vienna, studying under Freud and trying to treat our patients. And um, you can watch my run-through of this. Uh, there, I mean, this is... A crunchy game. This is a big game. This is a long game. This is more akin to what we were saying that Septima wasn't. Uh, yeah. This game will really push you hard, but it is full of so many really cool, wonderful elements. I uh, love the um, oh, what was the game? Canvas. Uh, that idea of hey, these people have dreams that we are trying to analyze through Eurostyle mechanisms, but we have to put these um, despair tiles over the top of them that uh, represent um, you know going deeper into the dreams. I mean, that's they didn't have to do that. They didn't have to go above and beyond with the really wonderful presentation. That just could have been a little baby card next to the main card, but they really try to capture the feel of, um, you know, an early turn of the century psychoanalyst actually trying to help people. But, um, as, as great as it is presentation-wise, what's really fantastic is the um, worker placement. At its heart, this is a worker placement game where we're hanging around in um, Freud's apartment in Vienna and sending these little uh, word balloon icons that indicate what we will talk about amongst our peers and contemporaries, uh, which represent all these different actions we can do. Gathering resources. Our most important resource in this game is insight into the maladies of our patients. And to, you know, cure somebody, I need to really understand about their, um, you know, their, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember what they were. It's not like, um, you know, really, it, 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 it's, it felt more natural and real. They were... Oh, I can't remember them now. But they weren't just despair and anger. They were much more clinical in their approach and very much fitting in the theme with uh, Freud's teachings. And... The important thing is, while you're doing the worker placement, which I don't think they're ever going to show because it is, uh, there it is, the worker placement. You only get to see it briefly because it's the most boring looking of all the boards because everything else looks so much more pretty. But um, (laughs) it's a worker placement slash area control game because once you've put your workers down, you can't interact with that particular action anymore. But by putting this down, I have potentially cut off a bunch of stuff that you would be able to interact with. Um, And uh, you're driving this worker control slash or worker placement slash area control game um, into a goods gathering, harvesting style thing to be able to convert them into cards or, you know, to complete recipes, i.e. cure your patients and race to, um, you know, 
basically become the toast of the town because the more you focus on particular clientele from different regions of the town, there's also this whole other rondelle game. This is definitely one of those games. It has like four games worth of stuff all combined into one. But um, sometimes that doesn't work out that well. But in this game, they all dovetail together because everything, you, every decision you make in one of the little simultaneous parallel mini games directly affects how well you're going to be able to interact with those other mini games too. And so you've got a lot of plates spinning in this absolutely stunning, stellar, gorgeous looking game from Fantasia, who I think uh, is very quickly going to become one of the uh, known as one of the premier production and design houses when it comes to crunchy, crunchy, and incredibly thematic Euros. Both Jen and I were just blown away by it. That's why it's number three on the list. Unconscious Mind. Yeah, great pick. Uh, th this is the exact game that I was thinking about when we were talking about Delta yep. uh, with all the different separate yep. separate uh, spots to it. But I think, I, I think that's exactly it, that Fantasia Games has sort of established themselves with Endless Winter and then putting out such a, a, a densely complex game that just works well with each other. I, I like all of the little games that are played yeah. in Unconscious Mind. This one was uh, is, is very exciting and is one that I would, I think I would really enjoy. I haven't played it, but uh, I, yeah, I, I, I'm very interested in trying this one out for sure. Okay. I think it's a great pick, yeah. All right. Well, what's number two? All right, number two, my last contribution to the list uh, His is personal number one, folks. My personal number one, my personal number one of the year. Uh, I think I've got to give it to, well, I know, because I've already submitted this beforehand. Yeah. I know I've got to give it to Earth. Uh Earth. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Earth, which was uh, by Inside Up Games. All right. They're the uh, they're the team that brought uh, you Summit, which everybody now knows because it was on Trey Parker's. Uh, it was Trey Parker's number one when right he did on the that. Dice Tower thing he did on yeah. the Dice Tower. Um, this game kind of represents what I look for in a crowdfunding campaign. Okay. Uh, in that. It was a great price. I, I got to talk about the price. It was 42 bucks Canadian. I'm uh, sorry, 42 bucks US, $54 Canadian. It had decent shipping. And it feels like it's going to give you a really solid game. It's a tableau builder. Okay. Uh, you, you're building 16 cards. You're putting 16 cards in front of yourself. The first person to, to trigger, to, to build 16 cards triggers the end of the game. Uh, but it has one of my favorite mechanics uh, of all time in it. And that's the follow mechanic. I've been doing mm -hmm. this series on my channel of just defining and ranking the mechanics. And I'm at numbers 10 to 1. And it's definitely going to go in there where I do something and I get to do the better version of that thing. Yep. And everybody else gets to do the smaller version of that thing. That's what that, that's what that mechanic is. And the whole purpose is to chain your actions together. Because in addition, whatever you pick... Uh, you get to then trigger the colors of the cards that you've added to your tableau. You get to trigger that as an as an additional action. And so, not only are you building your tableau and thinking about what uh, what things to put that'll give you the most points, you're also trying to think of okay, how can I optimize these actions down the line, uh, adding things in. It, it just looks like a really slick game. This I always do a pick of the week. This was my pick of the week. It's by a Canadian publisher as well. Inside ah. Up Games is Canadian, mm. so that that also Hometown that also here. might might have helped helped uh, push it to the push it to the top to represent Canada. Uh, and this is one that I know my mother purchased for me because <laughs> she uh, she watches my show and she saw me talking about it and was like, "Oh, I think he's gonna really like that one." And then she said, "Now I did purchase you something, and when it arrives, I need you to know that it's from me <laughs> and not from the publishers, just like wanting to send you a review copy." Uh, but I purchased it because you said it was like it represented a good deal on Kickstarter, and I think it really does. The amount of variability that you're gonna get here is huge. Uh, this is also. Emily from Man vs. Meeple, it's her number one game of all time. Oh, Just wow. having gotten it from the prototype and, and constantly playing it, because uh, I was watching their top 10, uh, their top 50, and, um, and it, it snaked into number one. And uh, yeah, I, I think the hype for this is, is, is real. I think it's going to be another great, really accessible game uh, in a theme. I like nature themes too. You know, I like that sort mm -hmm. of nature theme that I think Wingspan has pioneered. And 
yeah, this this one this one looks fun, and I'm excited. I'm excited to get it. So thanks, mom. And in order to make sure her pick, her purchase is justified, well, I had to put it as number one. There you go. Yes, yes, because mom knows best, definitely. <laughs> That's really interesting. I have to admit, I mean, this year it felt like there were a lot of Earth-themed projects. Yeah, definitely. And I don't remember this one. Uh, I have to admit. I Was it earlier in the year or later in the year? Because um, this one I... looks by far the best. This looks like, hey, it's Race for the Galaxy, yeah. but you know, on Earth. <laughs> yeah, it funded it funded March eighth. Okay, so, so it was March, earlier in the year. Yeah, yeah, earlier in the year. Um, I'm just scrolling through the videos on on my end too. I I, I felt like Kimberly might have covered it. Nope, but I don't know if she did. Nope, she didn't. Nope, she did not. But I wish she, she did. did not. Although I'm kind of wishing I did too because. I mean, I, I love, um, you know, like I said, that, that, that follow mechanism, yeah. you know, the whole, well, okay, yeah. I'll do the good yeah, version yeah. of everybody else gets the week. I mean, because, you know, it's less of, it, what makes that special is always the notion of um, paying attention. That, that is a direct form of yeah. player interaction. Everybody always ignores that. But when you're playing a game like this, or like Race for the Galaxy, for that matter, yeah. um, you are trying to figure out what is Chris going to do? Because if I can anticipate what you're going to do, I can do what I want to do while at the same time preparing for what I'll get to do for free on Chris's turn. And that is, to me, the most satisfying form of interaction, getting in your head and uh, somehow always being in the right place at the right time. Not because of luck or because the dice went my way or because of the cards I drew, but because I was able to anticipate and determine what my opponents needed and use it to my own leverage. So whenever a game does that, I mean, you're right to put it, uh, spoiler yeah. alert, for your upcoming top 10 greatest mechanisms of all time. I agree <laughs> completely. And yeah. man, it looked freaking gorgeous too. Jeez Louise. Yeah, I, I think the production quality here is great. And I, I also look at the stretch goals and what you get. And it wasn't it wasn't a huge amount, but you do get some nice wooden resource tokens, you know, some silk screen stuff, some nice little upgrades to warrant paying for that shipping price versus getting it in retail. Let me but, ask you, uh, did, yeah. you, you read the rules for it, I know, because you really did. Yeah. How heavy would you say it is from what you understand? Certainly um, not a gateway no. game, it doesn't look like. It looks like... Yeah, but no heavier than Wingspan. Okay, oh, oh, in kind I, of in the wingspan realm. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it, that does make sense because yeah. obviously they're yeah, targeting yeah. that audience too. It's a good reference point too. Yeah, that's why. Nice. But I would say probably wingspan will be a little bit more difficult to grasp. Personally, well, wingspan like, is I, three engines at once, basically. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when it gets yeah. going, yeah. I I find with yeah with wingspan, I know my barometer is usually my parents as well, mm. and and they had a little bit of trouble. Uh, understanding or, or remembering the activations yeah, in order, yeah, yeah. you know, so that 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 makes me. I I don't think wingspan is like a gateway. I've seen it not be as easily accessed. As I think it want to be. and ah. uh, yeah. I, I think we got what you were saying. You just dropped out there for yeah. a second. But that's okay, because, folks, yeah. we've made it to the number one. And I promise, you and I did not collude at all. And yet, your number two is such a beautiful segue into number one, globetrotting. Whoa. Oh, nice. nice. Hey, look, I, I will see your flat two-dimensional Earth and raise you a three-dimensional <laughs> Earth. Um, this was by far, uh, this might have been my wife's favorite games we played in the entire year. She cannot wait for this thing to come out, you know, available to retail. And you can talk about the, the value proposition of it and all that, because all I know is this game yeah, is yeah. so much fun to play. It is a bingo-style roll and write, or I should say flip and write, because you're not rolling cards, you're drawing, uh, you're not rolling dice, you're drawing cards, to determine how you are going to plan your three trips around the world. A trip for summer, for autumn, and for spring, summer, and autumn. And so we're in winter right now planning, but we're simultaneously planning three different trips on our absolutely stunning, awesome 3D globes that everybody gets to play with. And the toy factor of this is off the roof. It, it is every much, every bit as fun to play with and manipulate this globe as you would expect. Um, you know, picking it up, trying to figure out, well, okay, I guess I could go from Los Angeles Angeles to Puerto Rico. Does that make most sense? Um, well, it could be for my winter, but oh, Puerto Rico is currently available as a summer trip. Um, am I going to be able to, what, what am I actually going to pull off? 
Every round in this game, there are going to be three destination cards, and each of them is going to be associated to one of the three trips, and you've got to pick, right? Okay, well, it could be Puerto Rico in the summer, or it could be Carcassonne in the in the spring, or it could be a Bruges in the fall. And by the way, all the locations are um, references to famous uh, board game locations that we've had over the years, that. which is absolutely awesome just for hardcore fans. But um, every round, that is an incredibly tough decision because you're you're trying to do really well on all three of these tracks because you have, I have a goal for what my summer trip, my summer trip needs to be south of the equator. I never want to go north of the equator when I'm in my summer trip. In my, in my autumn trip, I need to see a lot of animal life. And so, as often as not, the uh, perfect card for your summer trip is what you could draft for your fall trip. And so trying to make those kinds of compromises and figuring out round around what is the best one to take. And everybody's choosing from, you know, the same three cards plus three, uh, oh, what do you call them? Uh, seasonal chips. Uh, you know, so it has kind of, oh, what do you call it? Um, that Cascadia entwined drafting, you know, where, oh, when I'm drafting a thing, I'm really getting two things. And sometimes those things work perfectly together. Chef's kiss. And other times like, okay, I'm going to make a huge sacrifice, but I need to get to Santorini. Um, before, and, you know, I'd, I'd rather do it in the summer, but okay, I'll do it in the fall. Because in addition to your own personal goals, there are public goals. And I mean, I'm just scratching the surface. This is a very simple to teach game. Because it has a lot of legs built in. Um, the, the standard way you play, everybody has a goal for their spring, summer, and fall, um, and, and you just play it pretty straightforward, simple. I would say probably Gateway, maybe Gateway Plus, but probably you could get away teaching this to anybody, and anybody's going to want to play it. If you see somebody sitting at a table playing with those globes, you will put your quarter on the table and say, I am next in order, please. I would like to play with those and draw all over them, because they're just they're fun to hold and um, all the rest of it. It's actually a really smart design, too, that you draw straight lines by using the ruler that, um, you know, is the uh, centerpiece of the holder. Everything about this game is smartly produced, but... I'm just describing the basic intro. You can increase the difficulty significantly by having more and more objectives. You can even start with an objective draft, where instead of having three, you'll have five. And during that opening draft, I might have gotten, hey, you know what? Almost everything is about my winter trip. I don't care about my summer trip or my autumn trip. And so you can have a lot of different ways the game evolves. And um, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, the toy factor of this alone makes it uh, fun to play. But when Jen and I started playing the heavier variants, and we saw, wow, Wow, this game gets incredibly crunchy. Every single choice. We are trying to fulfill five different things at once and trying to keep all this in our heads. It got, um, you know, as, cr as crunchy as we would want um, at, right after playing or as a lead into playing Unconscious Mind, another incredibly heavy game I talked about. And I absolutely loved it. Now, the one thing I can't say that I tried that I maybe love more than anything else as well is it's got a Between Two Cities vibe because if you are playing at higher than two, there are extra rewards that come out where if Chris is to my right, we both need to get to um, London. If we can both pull that, we will both score those points. So now we're colluding to try to, um, you know, go to the same place during the game so that we can share points and beat whoever is on the other side of the table that we don't care about. So I love that level of interactivity too. They replace it with another system in the two-player game that works equally well. I mean, this is, don't feel like, oh, if you get this as a couples gamer, you'll be missing out. I mean, because Jen, I mean, we played this one so much when I had the prototype. Much more than I needed to, to be able to film a run-through. And she was so sad. She said, do we really have to send this one away? Does it really have to go in the mail to the next? And I'm like, yes, honey, it does. But we will definitely get a copy of this, make no mistake. Because this could be, I mean, aside from the gimmick, which is absolutely wonderful, um, even if you somehow took that out and turned it into a 2D game, it would be um, on the, when you play with all those stuff turned on, on the crunchier, heavier end of rolling rights or flipping rights. And that's one of my favorite genres these days. Most of the time, these tend to be fairly light, but this, I would say, is heavier than crunchier than a gone shown clever. Uh, and then on top of that, it's got the coolest components you are ever going to play with, which is why it came in at number one of the year, globe trotting. And what did you think from what you saw of it? Uh, I, I like this. I like this pick. Uh, I think I think Kickstarter is the place for for these sorts of gimmicks. You know yes. what I mean? And I think I think Road to Infamy they're known for Canvas, right? Yes. They that was also a very very sort of gimmicky game with uh, creating with even just the box being able to hang on your wall, which mm -hmm. is so cool to me. Like I I think that's wicked. You're like, hey, you want to play a game? Sure, let me take this picture down <laughs> and just pull out a game. Like that's that feels so fun to me. Uh, I think Kickstarter is the place for these sorts of gimmicks yeah, that yeah, you yeah. may not see in wider retail distribution. Uh, 
for for me, I think I, I remember thinking it looked really cool. I, I also remember thinking that the globe itself was a cool gimmick, but that also increased the increases the cost of it, right? Mm, okay. And so from from like a cost to to like play perspective, I I I wasn't as interested because well, I was looking just at the retail version and it said, Oh, you saved twelve bucks on the on the retail version, I'm like, yeah, well, I, I would pay that in the shipping, so I don't really save anything from purchasing it right now. But it's definitely one that I, I was interested in trying. Like, mechanically, it looks so sound. Yeah. And and, and uh, that's surprising to hear. Uh, I, I was considering it also more of a two-player game as well. Yep. I, I like that you played it so much with Jen because I like the castle scoring, but I, I like having my own stuff that I don't have to share. And I think, I think when you're plotting your own trip around the globe, it, it feels fun to be able to just kind of do that for yourself. Yep. Uh, I, I think this one looks, looks really cool. And well, and for the antisocial, that is an option to play with the mode yeah. <laughs> where there are objectives between players to your left and right. Um, for folks cool. who would just like to not worry about what their neighbors are doing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but I think I think that kind of that kind of it, it embodies what Kickstarter is about. It's it's taking these fun ideas and saying, yeah, wouldn't it be cool if we had this? If we had a globe. We we're drawing lines on the globe. Let's yeah. make that happen. Yeah. Right. And, and and I like having games on my shelf that are unique. Right. That that do something that the, no other game does. Right. If it if it does something else, then I I wouldn't need both on my shelf. And and this I think would absolutely fall into that category. So no. I, I like it. I I like it as the number one pick. Well, that's it, folks. That was the top 10, by far definitive, uh, unassailable, definitive. best crowdfunded yep. games of 2022. Um, and I want to say thank you so much to Chris. I mean, uh, again, uh, your approach to this is such a breath of fresh air, and I cannot recommend everybody enough. Go check out his channel. You will not... It costs you nothing to subscribe, and, you know, he does more than crowdfunding. I mean, you're, you said, you coming up soon is your top 10 greatest Good. mechanisms of all time. What was it? I mean, you like, you counted down 300 mechanisms or something like that over the last uh, few yeah uh, listed on board game geek it's like i think 186 there you go but yeah. a lot of those are, are duplicates and so i started at 150 okay and so i've i've been counting from 150 up and now we're finally hitting the top 10 uh or I think out tomorrow, at least when we're when we're recording this live. So maybe out today will be twenty to eleven. Uh, okay. Well, they're coming soon, and plenty of other stuff soon. besides, folks. Yeah. You will not regret checking out Room and Board Reviews. And Chris, thank you so much for stepping in for Ruel. Don't worry, Ruel fans. He will be back next week for our final R and R of the month of the year, I should say. And before we go, one more thing. We're not done, folks. Did you know we have an after party? There is a post show where Chris party. and I will talk about 10 more games, the ones that just missed our list, uh, which was streamed live on the uh, 20th. And um, if you would like to check that out, you can hit that eye in the top right corner screen or follow the links down in the show notes to go to the extended version of this R&R and hear about a bunch more really great games. But with that done, um, Chris, we are Dunsville. Are you ready to go, sir? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was uh, a friggin' blast, and I think we did come up with the definitive list. So I, if anybody says differently, we can fight them battle royale. You, you, you know they're simply not real gamers. Yeah, it falls right down sorry. to it. Um, it's unassailable. Thank you, Chris. Thanks everybody for watching, and um, have a happy, happy holiday and a wonderful new year. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye.